So I'm Alicia Black, uh, as they said earlier, so I'm at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and I lead the Global Food and Agriculture Program. Um, I'm gonna let the folks who are helping take questions know that because that light is quite bright, when we do get into the audience questions, I might I have to depend on you to point them out to me because I can't quite see them. Maybe, yeah, could the projector get raised or is there any way to? Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll see if we can work on that. But while we are doing that, we're going to turn it over to our filmmaker to, to do a post-film survey. So over to you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for staying. Um, so again, if we can just repeat the, uh, the process <clears throat> now after the film, uh, by a show of hands, how many of you still have concerns for your safety or the safety of the planet with the current GMOs that are on the market? And how many people feel that the farmers in a place like Uganda should have the choice to use GMO for a fix like banana wilt? Does anybody, does anybody feel like the farmers in Uganda should not have the choice? You didn't put your hand up either way. Abstain, fair enough. Abstain is a decision. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to I'm going to go in reverse order and come back to you last, um, and I'll be introducing our panelists. I'm not going to give full bios because I want to make sure that we get into the conversation and then and then uh, can can get to questions. Um, but we have a really exciting panel tonight representing several views that are that I hope can inform the discussion. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Katie Pratt because she's the farmer among us. Um, so Katie is in Dixon, Illinois, and she's a seventh generation farmer. Is that right? My husband. Your, your husband is. Okay, great. And um, I'm going to start out with you um, to ask you what you farm and why you have decided to um, essentially help educate the public by participating in events like this and others. Um, and then the sort of three-part question here is what, what's at stake in your mind? So kind of tell us what you're growing. Tell us how you ended up in this kind of discussion. And then what do you see as at stake in this debate? Okay. And if I forget one, remind me then. Okay. Happy to. So um, she said, I'm Katie Pratt. My husband and I farm with his family just about two and a half hours west of Chicago. Um, we live in the Midwest. So what do we grow? We grow corn and soybeans and also seed corn for Wiffles Hybrids, which is a regional family-owned company that my father-in-law has been working with since the 90s. Um, we also have two kids, Ethan and Natalie, and they are also involved on the farm. Um, actually very much. So why am I involved in the conversation? I am a fourth generation farmer myself. My parents and my brother and his wife still farm. They have beef cattle as well as row crops. And uh, my dad raised pigs for 42 years. Um, so farming is quite literally and figuratively in my genes. So um, through a series of events about six years ago or so, I found myself in a position where I was able to serve a voice for American farmers and ranchers, just one of the many of them, and put me in front of um, audiences such as yourselves to just talk about what it is that we do on our farm. I can only speak from the experience that we have on our farm. Um, and the message I like to share is that farmers have choices. Everything we do on our farm is a choice. And because we have choices as farmers, so too do we as consumers have choices as well. If we did not have the choices we have, then we wouldn't have choice when we go to the restaurants or grocery stores. Um, what's at stake, uh, particularly when it comes to the discussion of science and agriculture, um, I, what's at stake is our ability to do better. You know, we're always striving to be better. Um, we are doing better than my grandfather did. And that's no disrespect to my grandfather. He was a wonderful man. Love you, Grandpa Ray. But he plowed his fields. He plowed them. He turned over the soil, like, deep. And we know now that that's something that does not contribute fully to soil health or to keep soil in place. So we learn. Um, and so if we X science out of the conversation on how we farm and how we make choices on our farms, we are going to be left um, with an abacus. You know, would you want an accountant doing your taxes with an abacus? Probably not. Um, so I, I just think that eliminating that, that 
piece of the conversation eliminates choices for us as farmers to do better. Thank you. I'm going to go to Mark Gislaine next. Um, Mark is joining us from the International Potato Center. Um, and for those of you who don't know, there's a network of international agricultural research centers, of which the International Potato Center is one, uh, that, are, that are breeding crops to make sure that smallholder farmers and, and, and all farmers um, can, can have uh, productive um, you know, disease-free crops. And so I want you to talk a little bit about SIP when I hand it over to you. But Mark is a uh, scientist. He is a degree-holding scientist. I think it's important to point out. He has a PhD in cell and gene biotechnology. And Mark, instead of saying what your research focuses on, can you talk a little bit more about SIP, talk about um, potatoes and some of the diseases you're working on, and then talk about what's at stake in your work from this yes. standpoint? Yes. <clears throat> so good evening, everyone. Um, Yes, I work for SIP, which is uh, the Spanish acronym for the International Potato Center. We are a network of uh, 15 centers dedicated to uh, improve crop, livestock, um, policies, and others, other aspects related to agriculture for the benefit of smallholder farmers in developing countries. We are funded essentially by government bodies, by foundation, and virtually very little by any company. So most of our products so far are public goods. They are not uh, subject to patent, they are not uh, uh, proprietary technology, because we want to reach smallholder farmers so that they can increase their productivity for food security, they can also increase their income so that the, the whole family can benefit from new technologies. So we use uh, science in agriculture, and uh, my motivation to go to this uh, um, institution rather than staying in a university was basically because I, I wanted to have an impact of the, the science on, the, on farming. I'm not a farmer, I'm a city boy. I always grew up in the cities. I ignored everything about farming. I'm still quite ignorant about farming, not as much as my, many of my colleagues in, in, in genetics, but um, uh, that's what motivated me to, to do this. And I think this uh, network of uh, centers, publicly funded centers, are really a, a fantastic opportunity to bring good signs uh, into uh, smallholder farmers to in, in, improve their livelihood. Great. And can you talk a little bit about uh, the diseases impacting yes, potatoes now, and your research? <clears throat> so each center has a focus, and our center is focusing on potato, sweet potato, and other and Andean root and tuber crop. M most of my work is on potato, and uh, we are uh, working since 2008 on developing... Uh, varieties, existing varieties, but turning them from highly susceptible to completely resistant to late blight disease. Late blight disease is the worldwide disease of the potato. Uh, you may remember that it's the, the one that caused the Irish famine back in 1840, 1845. In two, three years, about one million Irish people died, two million on the continent, uh, uh, died of uh, due to hunger, uh, ba basically because these fungus, well, not it's not really a fungus, but fungus-like organism wiped out all potato production. So today, wherever you produce potato, there is no alternative to use fungicide. Organic farmers have also to use fungicide. They use a different kind of uh, fungicide than the conventional one. It's copper sulfate-based fungicide. They are equally toxi to toxic. So the option of using GM for me is the obvious choice um, because it will uh, relieve these farmers from using fungicide, which are costly and cause an environmental impact, negative environmental impact. So that's why our institution is committed to develop these new varieties and as well as to release these new varieties in partnership with the national program. So we work a lot at the moment with Uganda, where we have a very uh, solid uh, collaboration with the national program, scientists, local scientists, 
to test this uh, potato in the field. And so far, so good. We have seen complete resistance to uh, late blight. Uh, not a single drop of fungicide has been ever used. Now it's about three or four years, about six uh, field season, in some in three locations. It's completely resistant to late blight. And by the design of the te technology, we think it can be durable. So durable, what does it mean? It means that it's, it's going to be longer lasting than anything we have developed so far. Will it be uh, 20 years or 100 years or 1,000 years? I don't know. I will probably not be here to, to, to see when it will uh, last, but at least it's better than any other uh, technology developed so far. So that's why we are very uh, strongly supporting the continuation of that work. Great, thank you. And then next we have Diana Horvath. Uh, Diana is also a scientist. Uh, she has a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology. And she's now at the Two Blades Foundation, co-founded or founded the Two Blades Foundation, which is dedicated to addressing uh, diseases in particular uh, and, and looking at some of the issues that are affecting smallholder farmers as well. And I wonder, Diana, there's certain uh, phrases that I feel like are probably um, second nature to you. So things like UG99 or um, talking about banana blight or or some of these other diseases that are perhaps less well known here. Could you talk a little bit about why Two Blades is dedicated to uh, disease control and what some of the stories are that we may not know and, and then what's at stake? Sure, thanks Alicia. Uh, so hopefully in, in the film that you've seen tonight, you already have an idea a little bit about how devastating the impact of diseases can be. You heard about it in papaya and banana uh, very vividly. And uh, just to kind of quickly go to the punchline there, I think the look on Francis's face in the film, to me is a very, very compelling reason why being able to have solutions to disease problems is so important. Uh, Two Blades got started because uh, when we formed in 2003, we could see that there was so much science that had led to discoveries that could have impacts like this, but they weren't getting out of the laboratory. And so the notion of Two Blades was to really function through a network of scientists who were making the discoveries, but also working together with other international agencies. There we go. Um, like SIP, uh, uh, and also with companies. So we have networks and with other foundations as well. And we do our work as a charitable foundation for public good. But by getting uh, interaction with and help from all of these participants. Uh, and the reason is, in addition to the diseases you've heard about here, all crops get diseases. Uh, in addition to these examples, potato is the third most important food crop. Wheat is very important, the second most important food crop in the world and has very uh, severe diseases that we also work on. Um, also made some great strides. In fact, we have one of the scientists we collaborate in the audience here today, and uh, Brian Stephenson at the University of Minnesota, who's been able to show that we can build a resistance gene stack and put it in wheat and protect it against some of its most severe diseases. So that's the kind of work that we do, and we'd like to get those benefits in the hands of farmers like Katie, for example, but also like Francis that you saw in the film. Uh, but part of the problem is we have a challenge that consumer perception prevents us from being able to do that. So for example, tomatoes, uh, get terrible bacterial diseases, we've actually field tested for more than 10 years now a solution by taking a pepper gene, which is a close relative of tomato, and putting that into tomato and shown that now tomatoes are protected. And uh, it doubles yields, it's done without any chemicals, and in Florida where they grow a lot of field-grown tomatoes, normally what they do is they spray copper sulfate on it, as, as Mark mentioned. That's Organic, by the way, but it's ineffective now. The bacteria that it controls are resistant to it entirely. But farmers spray anyway, just because they have to do something to try to protect their crop. So a lot of copper accumulates in the soils. Uh, and all the growers who've come to our trials and seen the solution that we have with this pepper gene love it. But they all say, we'd be happy to be the second adopter. 
Nobody wants to go first because they're afraid of losing their markets. And this is a story we just hear over and over again. So that's what's at stake. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, um, we're going to come to you next. So you are an Academy Award nominee. You have worked on a number of topics. Um, I, I'm not going to go through your, your entire resume here, but I would say there's an interesting uh, website I hope to, to check out later, which is Time Capsule Movies, which looks like your current project. That Should we all go check that out a little sure. later? Um, so I'm pointing it out because you, you have not worked on agriculture your whole life. You're not a farmer. Um, why did you decide to do this film? And it seemed like there might be other things at stake beyond just the debate on GMOs that you were pointing to. Can you talk a little bit about what you think is at stake here as well? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I did the film because I just wanted a big hug from all my neighbors. <laughs> thank you for playing along. Uh, I didn't know much about GMOs. I'm not a farmer, and I, I wish I could grow tomatoes. I love tomatoes dearly, and I kill them every single time, so I need to purchase my tomatoes. Um, but I came to the film, as Maria pointed out in her introduction, through, through IFT, who wanted to make a film to celebrate their 75th anniversary. And we went away and researched, and the GMO controversy was waving its hands, saying this is about food, and it's about science, and has issues that reach the first world and third world. And most importantly for me is many of my fellow documentarians had, we can decide what words we want to use here, gotten it imperfect or wrong or manipulative about what GMOs really are and um, how they should be used. And I'd never seen a single film that talk to the scientists who you see in the film, Dennis, Pam, Allison, and others. And uh, that was exciting, but also embarrassing uh, for, as, a, as a documentarian that so many people had gotten it wrong. So our approach to it was, it was always science-based. That's what led us. Um, and as Neil deGrasse Tyson, he gets cornered sometimes at book signings, and people say, are you, did you take this film on because you're pro-GMO? He says, I'm not pro-GMO, I'm pro-science. And that's really the, the thing that we want the film to do, is defend using science to make good decisions. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the, to the, back to the panel here, but before I do, I, I kind of want to get a sense of what drew the audience out tonight, because I think it'll help us to shape the conversation a little bit, um, if you'll allow me. So I'm curious, how many people uh, came to this because they're really excited about documentary film? Oh, okay, a couple. Nice, thank you. How many of you, how many of you have a, a passion or an interest in food? You like to eat, don't we all? Good How answer. many of you um, have a passion for agriculture or farming? Right. Fewer, but it's still a few. And then I'm going to ask, how many of you lived on a farm or have visited a farm in the last year? OK, great. So I'm going to go back to um, the farmer on the panel again. I'm going to ask, how do you make choices about what you grow and who to trust as you're thinking about the technologies that you use on your farm? Uh -oh. Oh. I could really oh, I'm sorry. I'm a scientist, so I'm interested in hearing about science Perfect. and learning about what the opposition of science sounds like. Great. Can I ask, how many scientists do we have in the audience with degrees? Great. Thank you. Good clarification. Who's in for science? All right. So how do you decide who to trust, and how do you decide what to grow um, is the question. Sure. So again, we, we grow corn and soybeans and seed corn. So we're growing the seed that farmers, including ourselves, that will plant for the next year and the coming years. Um, how do we decide which hybrids and varieties to plant? Well, we have to look at um, the research trials that the seed companies will put out, as well as individual farmers. There's a lot of farmers that will plant test plots where they will put in a variety of hybrids or a variety of varieties. Soybeans are varieties, corn is hybrid. Um, that's why I'm using those terms. And they will, they will put out their own information. This is what we discovered in our test plot. And so we use that type of information. We use the information that we have gleaned from our own farm, our own historical information. So um, I like to call it tractor technology. Today's tractor technology allows us to map our fields so that we have a map of soil fertility, 
a map of soil moisture. We have a map that shows us the yield that we um, got from the previous year. And when we lay all that on top of one another, we are able to look at that field and at that soil type and say, this hybrid performed well or it didn't, and we need to make a switch. Um, one of the practices that we have adopted on our farm is that we never plant the same hybrid or variety in the same field in consecutive years. Um, it's one way that we think we can try to combat any sort of resistance, uh, weeds and or diseases. We also do not use the same type of um, pest control either. So we try to keep it, we try to keep the bugs guessing essentially, right? Um, what are they going to do next year? So um, who do we trust? Well, we, we trust, as do many of us, I think, if you'd say, who do you trust? Um, I trust my family, right? I trust my neighbors. And that's who we deal with on the farm. Um, I think there's this mentality that like the farmer is just being eaten alive by big corporations, whoever those are. And, and the, the people we deal with, we went to high school with. Like, they're our neighbors. They, they went off to school and they got schooled in plant science and biology and chemistry and they came home back to our area and started their families and their careers and now they are our partners on our farm to advise us on soil fertility and inputs and fertilizer inputs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Farmers in the slow season, quote unquote, winter time, um, we spend a lot of time reading. We spend a lot of time attending meetings um, so that we can compile our own information so that we're able to make a determination on what's the best fit for our farms. Thank you. Um, Diana, I'm going to jump over to you. Um, so you mentioned um, you know, different, different companies that you work with, and, and I'm, I know that you work with companies as well um, at Two Blades, and I'm curious, what is it that multinational companies or private sector companies bring to the table when it comes to technology? I mean, I think a lot of the questions in the film were about corporate control of food, um, but obviously companies like Monsanto and others have produced a lot of products that farmers are farming. So what is it that they bring? And then how do you answer critiques that people may have about collaborating with, with private sector organizations? So uh, companies like Monsanto, Pioneer, and so forth, what they do are they produce seeds. Uh, and this is uh, a specialty. It's certainly not something that Two Blades has the capacity to do. It's an entire business in and of itself. Uh, in some ways, you could imagine we're kind of like an app producer or something, and they're like a cell phone company. So we're providing something that we think is uh, beneficial to the final product. Uh, but we're not manufacturers, and that's why we partner with them. Um, and it's also having uh, a reality in terms of market, making a product that is wanted by a grower, basically, uh, who is the customer of a seed company. So they're in touch with their market. Um, obviously, they have to make a profit like any business, and for some people, they have difficulty with the notion that if you're producing seeds, that profit should play a part in it. Uh, but in fact, that investment into making good quality products is really important. And, and they have uh, to bulk seed, they have to do quality control, they have to market and distribute and all of those things have costs. And if you want to have good quality options for those things, uh, it takes investment. And of course, businesses need to make an income uh, on their investment. So. Uh, that's why we partner with them. They know their business very well, and if we want those seeds that we're working on to reach farmers, they're part of the ecosystem. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Mark. We saw in the film that there was this influence between decisions made in the U.S. or Europe or other places and, and attitudes in Africa, or perhaps there's you know, uh, other influences that are exerting themselves. What's the conversation like um, in Kenya, uh, and how do you think that influence channel is, is occurring, if it is? Do you think we actually have an influence on debates elsewhere here in the States? Well, I think the, the in general, the discussions are not that different in uh, Kenya and Uganda. Um, to people's mind, GMO are very new. The concept of GMO is very new. Um, it is um, a technology that I think people don't really understand why 
on one side of the world in the US, it's pretty much accepted. Uh, it's been grown since quite a long time um, with no major problem. And on the, the other side, in Europe, where you know, it's another part of the world that has a great deal of influence in, in, in Africa, uh, it's not grown, at least in most of the European country, where there is a, a de facto moratorium, a ban, uh, by uh, very complex legislation and, and really some, even in some country, uh, a law that prohibited farm to, farmers to grow GM crops. So I think the, the debate is a bit um, influenced by what is happening in the, in, in the developed world. And uh, I think sometimes it's not easy for, for uh, people in Africa to understand what, what should be their position if their two uh, blocks, you know, mentor blocks, uh, have such different difference of opinion. But basically the concerns are the same. Is it safe? Does it have a negative impact on the environment? And one very important, probably more important point than in other countries is uh, how much the big corporations is, are going to benefit. Is, is this going to be the end of our local uh, sovereignty on our seed? Is this going to make our farmers more dependent on the big agro industry? Uh, but on the other side, uh, they know that agriculture innovation comes from these big companies as well. Uh, and so they also know, know that they can make big yield gain by adopting modern seed. Uh, and also they know that they can reduce uh, chemical input, which is costly and toxic. So that's the debate which is going on and it's pretty much the same kind of debate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Scott, I'm curious why you think there are so many films about food and agriculture, so many documentaries that have come out in the last five or 10 years, and is that related to some of the funding we've seen here? Because I, when I turn on Netflix or Amazon Prime, I have lots of choices about where to get information about food and agriculture, and I'm just curious what you think is driving that, and how, as viewers, we can, we can be, uh, know what's, what to trust. <clears throat> Second half is much harder. Um, I, I think the uh, the interest in food is has been very has been very healthy and and exciting. Uh, so, so even some films that I find to be imperfect, and I'll put Food Inc. Uh, right on the line for that. It's one of the most successful food films ever made. Um, if that film was successful at making us think about where our food comes from and make us think about what uh, the toxicity and the sustainability of farming systems, great. Um, sadly, it was also manipulative and, and, and failed at, I think, using science. Um, in a lot of the points that it tried to make, it really had kind of an, an ideology to push. And I think that is been a piece of why some of these films has become very popular, that there was sort of this general distrust of what big food is, which is obviously very squishy, uh, big agriculture, big government, big money. That was all bad and toxic. And then here was this beautiful fix in or organic farming. Some did this. Organic farming is a completely valid uh, process and should be a choice. But some on the marketing side said, here is the perfect answer. And as a father, one of the more, most interesting pieces of that is that in getting you to buy that product, you were a better parent, too, which I've never seen in any other product. And that has been incredibly, incredibly powerful. So I'm straying a little bit no. <laughs> from your question, but it's, I think that's, those, are all, those are all pieces of it. So um, I'm happy that people are asking more questions about food and farming. I'm frustrated by how many films have become successful with very, a very low bar of, of, of quality data and is re are really pushing ide an ideology. So how do we decide, how do I teach my two daughters how to determine a film of quality, a, 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 a information of quality, um, is to do the research and look who's you know, behind it. And it's not just funding, which funding is important, follow the money is incredibly important. But I don't have a problem, as you see with Charles Benbrook in the film, I don't have a problem if Whole Foods funds Charles Benbrook's study. I don't have a problem if IFT 
paid for my film. I have a problem if Charles Benbrook promises results to the people who he's giving to, and he manipulates the science just enough to get his point, acro his point across. Same thing. I couldn't promise results to IFT. I had to go on this journey and tell this story as honestly as possible. So um, it's very hard, but, but do the work. And, and we also have to celebrate the institutions that we can trust, right? And, and, and remember that. We're living in a very fragile time about distrust and confusion. And we have to remember that not just the process of science, but there's people out there doing good work, like some of the people on this panel, everyone on this panel. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, I just said some of the people. That's <laughs> hilarious. Um, and, and, and remember that. But, but we, it's very hard to, to, to determine between you know, a, 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 an honest broker and a dishonest one. Well, and I, I'll just add that I was recently out at, um, in Silicon Valley talking to some folks at Facebook about uh, fake news and how they were trying to label fake news. You all probably know this, but they were trying to label news that they thought was uh, not credible or had be been debunked. Mm. And they found that people shared it at a higher rate when it was marked that way. So instead of discouraging us to... to to share it, people were sharing it more. So they stopped labeling that. So they're trying to come up with other, so they, there's something in our psychology that kind of likes the drama of some of these things. And I, I think that's an interesting uh, look into our psychology. I want to um, switch to taking questions from the audience because I think we have limited time here and I want to make sure you have engagement. I know we have online questions. So I'm going to take them, I think we're going to do one in the room and then one online and switch back and forth and I'll take them as I see them and try to bounce around. So you're, you're first. So we'll get the mic here. And, then and if you could tell others. us your name and what you do, that'd be Absolutely, great. Absolutely, that'd be great. My name is Jean Smiling Coyote. I have a comment and a question. First, I subscribe to the scientific journal Nature. Mm -hmm. I do read all those peer-reviewed articles about GM organisms. I don't take notes, but I read them. Uh, my degree is in geography. That is a science. The important thing is it's interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. We don't get to say, oh, Here's, the, the, here's this, we don't have to pay attention to that. We can just ignore that other thing too. So when I was watching this film, my head was exploding with questions about, well, what about this factor? What about that other factor indirectly related to GM organisms? And of course, if they'd all been addressed adequately to my satisfaction, the film would have been 10 hours long. <laughs> but that was a problem for me. But the question is, there was a short segment about the tobacco companies that all that used to, or still do, try and convince you their product is safe. And they showed some old ads. And there was also an ad from Native American Spirit. And circled was the part that uh, there's no additives. It's just pure tobacco. And the implication by including that was that they were trying to persuade uh, consumers that their product was safe. And I've seen their ads in print. And I don't see any effort to convince uh, potential buyers that their product is safe. They're just saying that it doesn't have the additives, any additives like you know the regular mainline. So what's the what's products. the question? So why was that included? Okay, uh, so why did I include the image of the natural cigarettes? Yeah. Yeah. I was I was implying that they were using the word natural to make their cigarette seem better than another cigarette, and both of them can give you cancer. Right. So both of them can give you cancer. They're attempting to try and say, well, if you buy our cigarette, you have a less of a chance of getting cancer, which I thought was, that was the reason we used it. It doesn't mean we have to agree, but fair enough. Let's take a question from online. Do you have, have the conferences I.O. up? Yes. Somebody, so yes. the first question from online is that some impacts take years or decades to develop and link to a central cause. Uh, so how far back do studies on GMOs cover? Great. I think that's for Diana and Mark. Well, actually, maybe you don't know that too much, but GMO are as old as we are. <laughs> um, you know, we've been sequencing human genomes since 2001. Uh, since then, we've been studying what is the genetic constitution of human beings. <clears throat> and in 2015, uh, they published that there are at least 100... 50, 150 genes that are suspected to have come not by descent from our parents, but from some microbes that we live with. 
at some stage in evolution towards uh, human beings. So we all have genes from uh, other species, microbes, virus. Uh, so we, we, we are actually natural transgenic or GMOs. Uh, a couple of years later, we at SIP actually found <clears throat> that one of the crop which is uh, consumed by uh, a large part of the population, the seven most important food crop, sweet potato, is also naturally uh, genetically engineered by nature. So there are, in, in the domestication of uh, crops, there are elements of, um, of the science that give us uh, uh, assurance that just the fact of transferring a gene from another species into this species in itself doesn't create a problem. Um, so now the recombinant DNA technology, which is the, what we are doing now, um, is, uh, uh, is uh, as old, I mean, it started around 1975, and the first GM crop which were released is, were in 96, so it's about uh, 20 years of uh, risk assessment. So that's quite a long time for this technology. And since 1996, as it has been mentioned, there has been a single documented, documented case of a negative impact on human health as well as on the environment. So that's 22 years of deployment of GM crop uh, in the world. Today, 13% of the total um, area, cultivated area of the world is uh, grown with GM crop. So if there would be a risk or if there would be a negative impact, we would know it by now. And uh, so we have a long history of experience with uh, GMOs. Anything you want to add on that? Sure. Sure. I can just add to uh, what Mark said, which is, yes, there's a long history and uh, extensive acreage and not a single report of any untoward health uh, issue. Um, and that they've lasted. The, the papaya case, for example, has been effective the entire time. So these are really effective products. In fact, there are several other disease traits that have been demonstrated in the lab that have been sitting in testing or inside universities. Really the first one that came out since the papaya in the late 90s just happened this last year in potato. Uh, but that was the first GM disease resistance trait because there just been so much concern about it. Um, but safe, proven, effective technologies. And we, actually, I'm told I shouldn't refer to them as technologies. That's the scientist in me. Uh, technology sounds so sterile and clinical, uh, but it's how we tend to think. But uh, they're solutions. They're also technologies. Let's take another. We've got a couple more questions in the room. I'm going to go to the one in the center. And then when I, when we, after we come back on my online, I'll go to you, sir, in the back. So in the center here. Looking, he's looking something up in the back there. I like All that. Right. He's got it planned. Um, is this good? Hi. Okay, so... Um, Tell us your name, the, what you do. Sorry. This is MJ. My name's MJ. I'm a substitute teacher. Um, I, my question is for the filmmaker. And yes, we saw farmers and they were represented in the film, but did you make any attempt to reach out to possibly find a group or an interest group that represents the uh, health concerns of low-wage migrant workers, you know, with respect to their um, exposure to pesticides and herbicides, fungicides, and any, you know, chemicals that are used in the farming process. Sure. You know, I mean, did, was that uh, a, deliberate, a deliberate decision, deliberate omission? You know, it, the toxicity was discussed, Correct. you know, and they showed, okay, well, toxicity goes down, but the pounds of chemicals are going up. Okay, and that was perfectly reasonable logic, but um, either way, do you think maybe that that group could have been represented more in your film? It's a, it's a, fair, it's a fair question. Uh, some people conflate GMOs with pesticides, right? So this film... And they're not. Right, right. So, so this, this film is really trying to reset the conversation yeah. on GMOs. 
not reset the conversation on pesticides. So that's the reason that we didn't that we didn't include that. So we included that example of pesticide toxicity because it was directly related to GMO technology. To get into every aspect of the pros and cons of pesticide is a, is a different film and is a fine film to make. Um, I hope somebody would make it and actually show that if you wash your fruits and vegetables, we're living with the safest, most sustainable, affordable, nutritious food available in the history of mankind. Um, but to your point of the, the effects on farmers, that's just a different film. Let's do a question from Conferences I.O. All right, so our next question from online is, could you discuss the possibility of the selection for super pathogens due to gen genetically modified organisms? Not my place. <laughs> Can you just repeat the question? I want to make sure I understood that clearly. So the question from online is, could you discuss the possibility of the selection for super pathogens due to GMOs? So I, th I think this is a question that really derives from the use of antibiotics in the healthcare system and the fact that there is a crisis in antibiotics uh, failing uh, basically because pathogens have evolved to overcome that. And so I'm, I'm going to assume that's kind of what the question is asking. Um, actually, what you find is almost the inverse to some degree that in conventional breeding, so, so crop disease has been around throughout history, and it's been a major objective of conventional breeding to try to breed better alternatives for resistance. And what generally happens is you have simple resistances, and if you do any further breeding, those get separated uh, from each other. So when you have individual resistance genes, for example, they can be overcome by a pathogen. So in a sense, you're kind of creating that super race. But actually what you're doing is you're defeating the resistance gene because you haven't deployed it carefully. But if you are familiar with AIDS and the current uh, preferred treatment, it combines three drugs, a triple cocktail, to try to prevent AIDS, and that's been stable. And so the notion there is that you're making multiple barriers for the pathogen to overcome, and that becomes uh, uh, just astronomically harder and harder to overcome all of those three things simultaneously. And it's the same approach that we are really devoted to in disease resistance, which is to have multiple disease resistances. So it's like having a, a, your front door, you don't want an intruder to get in, you put on five locks on the door. It's kind of the same, same thing. And by doing that, you can limit the ability, uh, really, of the pathogen to overcome the resistance, because of course, evolution favors for survival, and so pathogens want to eat themselves, they're going to be selected for. But you can make the barrier so high that they can't overcome it, and that's uh, durability. That's the goal. All right, gentlemen, back with the research. You have your cell phone out. Okay. I can, wait for the mic. Can you wait, wait for the mic for the online? So they can hear you online. It's coming. Okay. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm Kevin. Um, I did an undergrad in bioengineering at Duke. Um, and so my question is this. Uh, so the gene drive is a self-replicating gene that spreads itself quickly through an entire species. Um, also, unrelated, my buddy at Harvard's working on, uh, working on a virus that to insert genes for fluorescence into mice brains. So my question is this. Um, how can we be sure this technology won't lead to a gene for something such as like cannibalism or whatever to be accidentally spread across the entire human species you know, thus triggering like a zombie apocalypse type of thing. Sorry, so, so your friend is working on a zombie apocalypse? What's no, he's, he's, working, he's working on a virus to, to, uh, to add fluorescent genes to mice brain cells to like make cool pictures, but you know, like. How, so how could this, could this technology be used for good or evil? How do we I'm determine? It, yeah. it, like if he's not careful, he could just accidentally forget to wash his hands, the virus gets out. Yeah, like, well we should definitely stop your friend. Let's just start there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's not my place to, to come. <laughs> no, we got to answer it, though. Yeah. No, sorry. So it, what your friend is doing is a pretty commonplace thing. It's called using a marker gene. And it's a, because mo molecules are microscopic. You can't see them. So if you want to do experiments, you have to 
come up with ways that you can see the results of what's going on, patterns of gene expression or something like that, which I expect that's what he's trying to understand. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Basically, you're just trying to see from some visible marker what's happening inside a cell or an organism. And this is very commonplace, actually. We've learned a lot about gene function that way. Um, how that becomes a zombie perpetuating situation, I don't really understand how that would be. What, what would be the... I, it's a, it's that's a separate technology uh, and Mark I don't know if you want to share this one but um, that's it, it's apples and oranges uh, but I understand your point your your point I think is that things could maybe get out of control but generally these it's not very easy to perpetuate these things uh, without some sort of selective advantage there has to be something that makes it, most of the work isn't doing that, it's testing what is the function, maybe it confers a beneficial trait. Um, so it's, it's extremely unlikely, but you could say any technology could be used for good or evil, and that's certainly true here. Uh, it, it, a nefarious person could use it uh, to, to make a toxin or, or something if they really chose to, but most scientists really want to benefit the world and are trying to do something good and with government support, by and large, which has to be severely vetted, and science is a very iterative process. It doesn't work most of the time, uh, so you have to keep refining the question and making it better. So uh, you'd have to be very evil and committed to try to make that work. One more online. Okay. Yeah, one more online question. So we'll our next online yep. question then is, what do you think is the most effective way to overcome the fear that has been historically associated with GMOs? I'm going to let everybody take a shot at that one real quick. And Katie, can we start with you? So I, as Scott alluded to earlier, it's doing, doing the research. It really is. Um, and it, and I, I would even make it even more simple. Talk to a farmer. Just ask. There's nothing. We're not hiding anything. And as I said, we, we're just couple hours drive if you'd like to visit a farm, you're more than welcome. We always make that offer wherever I go. Do the research so that, um, and I'm going to come back to this because I'm, I'm talking as a mother as well and as the primary food buyer for my family. You have to be comfortable with the decisions that you're making for your family. And so if your research leads you to um, buying all organic produce or um, all foods that are labeled a certain way, and that is what is comfortable for you, for your family, then by all means, that is your choice to do that. Um, it's also my choice to not do that either. Um, and, and I think that's where the conversation gets a little diluted because you have the extreme ends on either side that talk really loud and those of us in the middle get lost a little bit. Um, so. I, that's what I would say is that it's just important to continue to reach out to credible resources and, and things are always evolving, so constantly being up to date. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, well, I don't have much to add uh, different than what you've just said. I think uh, having the experience of uh, a, farming, a farmer growing a, a GM version of, of the crop um, is is the most convincing uh, experience you can have about to overcome the fear when the farmers explained that before they had so much um, yield loss due to disease and, and and other things and they had to put, to spend so much money in purchasing uh, pesticides to protect their, their crop and after adopting that they don't have uh, so much problem they have uh, in a new income. Um, I think this is ex excellent uh, experience for, for one who has who's skeptic about the benefit of GM crop. So go to the farm, farmers growing GM crop and ask them uh, questions. They will be happy to, to answer. Diana. It's hard to add to that. I think options and having tangible experiences uh, with, with these kinds of crops is the way would gain comfort with them. I think also education in schools, more about 
the application of technologies is really important. Um, a lot of people are more prepared to take risks when it comes to biomedical uh, uh, inventions and discoveries, and less so with agriculture, and I think that has to do with people's experiences. So anything that can expand people's experiences um, to help them see that these are beneficial products would be good. Scott? I'll try and be quick. <clears throat> um, the difference between a skeptic and, and a denialist is a good thing to look at in these situations, right? Being skeptical is wonderful and important. And if you are skeptical of a situation, so I'm, if someone was skeptical of the safety of a, GM, of a GM crop, and they wanted to go down the road to see if their skepticism, there was evidence to s support that skepticism, that's fine. But if they went down that road and they were presented with evidence that went contrary to that skepticism, telling you that it's safe and it's lower toxicity and all these things, and they still choose to say that they're skeptical of GM, they're not a skeptic anymore, they're a denialist. And I think it's very important for us to, to distinguish between those things and, and come correct. And, and any of us are, are available to being that person, being a denialist, because of things like confirmation bias. We want the world to be the way we want it to be. It's very hard to get outside of those bubbles, as, as Mark pointed out. So I beg us all to come correct and use good, good evidence to support our positions. Thanks. We have one last question in the back of the room, and then we're going to wrap up, and I'm sure people here would be happy to talk to you all as we dismiss. Uh, so go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, Tim Irick. I work for Southern Garden Citrus. We're on the forefront of, of fighting citrus greening uh, with biotechnology. I really just have two comments. Uh, to the comment on super pathogens, I welcome that person to come look at Florida Citrus. We already have super pathogens. One, call, one is called Hong Lung Bing, citrus greening. It's a, it, you can't cure it. It's a super pathogen now in a crop that has no resistant gene. So we're going to have to bring a gene from elsewhere to save the citrus crop worldwide. Okay? Uh, so super pathogens exist. Which leads me into the second question to the migrant workers. I think we need to clarify something in that toxin level. That toxin level was, was Roundup being reduced. Those are broad acre crops that migrant workers don't walk in and they're not hand harvested. They're, they're mechanized, right? So my argument would be citrus is all hand harvested. And we have actually two diseases we can't control, citrus canker and citrus greening. Citrus greening is an insect vector disease, so you have insecticides. Same thing would, would be in bananas. Same thing could happen in peppers. Same thing could happen in grapes, biotechnology to cure diseases like that and insects like that will reduce exposure to migrant workers and make harvesting safer. That's the fallacy, that is the fallacy of the GMO argument on worker safety. Without being able to do this, we expose our workers to more things. And when you tie our hands to do that, you're tying the hands of migrant workers. And so just from a farmer's point of view, because that's what we are, we're, we are a farming operation that is funding our own research to cure disease that is affecting. Uh, Katie and your husband, I honor you for seven years. I work with a young farmer that's six year, sixth generation citrus grower that is scared to death under his watch his hands will be tied and he will lose a legacy farm. And that's what's in front of the citrus industry in the state of Florida, state of California, and around the world because of a super pathogen. So, No question, just thought I had to make a statement. Thank you. Right. Thanks, sir. Um, okay, I think we're, we're out of time for now, but as I said, I think people will want to, to talk to the, uh, to, to the panel here. But before I go, I want to see if the panelists have any last words, anything they want to leave us with, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess I, I never really did touch on why we made the choice to plant genetically modified seed on our farm at all. And so there's, just, there's a few things to tick off. One, um, we reduced the amount of pesticides that we apply to our acreage by half. We have those numbers to prove that. And as they pointed out in the film, the toxicity level of what we do use has decreased. So my husband, my father, my brother, my brother-in-law, my father-in-law are safer in what they do in the field. Um, 
And they also are licensed to do that, and that's a whole other discussion, but they have to take, they have to go to school for it. They have to pay money to get a license to say they can do it. So, you know, it's not just, we don't go to the hardware store and buy a bottle of it. You, we got to go through the process. Um, the use of genetically modified seed on our farm has allowed us to adopt uh, conservation practices that before we didn't feel like we were able to uh, control the pest pressures that would come along with those practices. So no-till, meaning we do not turn over the soil, um, cover crops in certain areas to help control soil erosion. Um, and it's also then in bulk allowed us to do more with less. And so as I alluded to earlier, genetically modified organisms are not the silver bullet. It's just a piece of the pie that we as farmers use, uh, one of our tools in our tool belts. And so that choice of having that tool available to us combined with everything else that we are learning by day on how to farm and to do better um, is just giving us opportunities to really improve upon what our, our grandfathers and our great grandfathers did so that my kids would have the opportunity to do this as well. Thanks. Any final words? One comment? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I think that the, uh, often the, uh, the debate is about GM or not GM. And uh, often I'm asked, uh, well, you are pro-GM. And, and I always say, uh, actually, no, I'm not pro or anti-GM, because in the same way, I'm not pro-microphone or anti-microphone. <laughs> it's a tool. GM is only a tool. And it depends how you, you use it. You can use it for the greatest benefits of the farmers. You can use it also for the greatest benefit of the seed producer. So it's one of the tools uh, that we uh, are ab have been able to add to the toolbox of the breeders that are making variety that are more resilient uh, to climate extreme, more resistant to pests and diseases, and now also that have improved nutritional quality. Tomorrow it will be gene, uh, gene and genome editing. Uh, the day after tomorrow, it will be something else. So these are only tools. What is important is what, what is the goal you are pursuing and what is the value of the new uh, variety to the farmers, to the consumers, and to the environment. I'd just like to finish off with a couple of numbers to keep in your mind, which is that every day around the world, 150,000 people roughly die from all causes, um, all diseases, accidents, hunger, everything. At the same time, the current estimate is that 820 million people go to bed hungry every night. And two billion people suffer from hidden hunger, which is caused by not getting enough vitamins and minerals, and it leads to a lifelong stunting and other limitations in their life. Uh, and so that's today. We're set to add 2.3 billion more people to the planet by 2050. That's, uh, I believe it's the equivalent of the population of the US, Mexico, and China or something together. So all those people have to have places to live, which means there's actually probably gonna be less land to farm. So we have to do more to feed more mouths with the land we have now. So whether or not you're pro or against GM, we do need tools to be able to feed everybody. And in the context of crop disease, we also know that crop diseases are only getting worse. They're moving from the equator towards the poles at a rate of three kilometers a year. So. It's a growing problem, and we need all the tools that we can have to make sure everybody gets enough to eat. Um, yeah, I'll just do one about communication. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Thank you all for dialoguing, dialoguing with us. And uh, if there wasn't a question that was answered tonight by me, I don't mean to speak for the other panelists, but I feel confident that this is true, you can find us. We're available. All the scientists, anyone that was in the film, if you want to ask a question of them, Go to foodevolutionmovie.com, look at all our social media feeds, ask us the question. So when people say that you know, these 
people don't want you to know some of these issues. That's not true. Ask, ask the questions. Be skeptical, but don't be cynical and don't be a denialist, please. Communicate. Thank you. Great. And that concludes our panel. If I could just ask the audience to thank our panel. Thank you all for your questions, too. And uh, we'll be up here ready to talk. <laughs>